Greetings from uh, Beacon Baptist uh, Church. This morning we are going to look at the three wonderful and blessed benefits that we all receive when we go through difficult times. I don't think there is anyone who does not go through difficult times. But 1 Peter chapter 4 is talking about people going through difficult times because of Christ. That's the qualification there. Suffering because of Christ. In fact, in John chapter 15, Jesus tells that you will be hated to his disciples who are saying this. You will be hated because of my name's sake. Because you don't belong to this world. And the world is going to hate you without any reason. Without any reason. Without any cause. You'll be hated. Peter heard that message, no doubt about it. And in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, if you kindly turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4, we can go through the entire chapter. Three wonderful and blessed benefits that can come to Christians when they go through suffering in the will of God. Number one, verses one to six. In this we see that Christians are purified through the fiery trials that they face. As Christians, when we face fiery trials, we'll be purified, purified just like gold is purified when it is put in fire. When life is easy, we drift into carelessness and sin, but suffering changes our values and goals. When difficulties come, we draw closer to God, don't we? And we start examining our life. What is wrong with me that I'm going through this? There may be no reason why you're going through this difficulty. Because Jesus has said, without any cause, the world is going to hit you. Huh? But in the broader plan of God, we suffer according to the plan of God. And here it says that suffering is going to purify as Christians. First of all, we're going to look at verse 1, which says that we are made to identify with Christ's suffering when we go through sufferings. We identify with Christ's sufferings. Look at verse 1, it says, For as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind for he that had suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin christ is in the picture here jesus suffered for our sin's sake in the flesh now we have to identify with christ if Christ died for sin, we need to cry, die to sin. Is that clear? Die to sin. We are dead. We must be dead to sin. We need to cease from sin. Hate sin and love God more. We need to cultivate the mind of Christ. Christ said, which one of you can convince me of my sin? Isn't it? No one could convince Jesus of his sin. Because he did not sin. He was impeccable. He was without sin. He died for the sins of the people without sin. He was a pure lamb of God. That becomes the basis for us to live a life that is holy. Identifying with Christ. 
when sufferings come in our life, we need to think about Christ's suffering. He suffered for our sin's sake. We need to separate ourselves from sin. Stop sinning in our life. We all do sin one way or the other. But we all must make a sincere effort. We all must make a sincere effort to give up sin in our life. Then we see that time is really very short, isn't it? Our time on this earth is very short. Life is short. Sufferings, in fact, remind us the brevity of our life. Our life is short. Look at verses 2 to 3. That no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh. The rest of his time indicates that our life is brief on this earth. 70, 80, 90. Hardly we see people who are 90 years. Hardly we see people who are 90 or who are in 90s. Our life on this earth is very brief. It says here that no longer should live the rest of his life, time, in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. We need to keep in mind that our life here on this earth is short and we need to live to do the will of God. Jesus said, my need is to do the will of my Father. He came to do the will of God. You and I should know the will of God, know the Bible, live according to the word of God, that is the will of God. Verse 3 tells, for this time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, less excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Look at what kind of life we lived. We live like uh, non-Christians. I don't like to use the word Gentile at this point of time because it is not relevant. All right? Christians and non-Christians. We don't have to live like non-Christians. Sometimes we say non-Christians are better off than Christians. But if we as Christians live according to the word of God, then there comes a distinction between the life of a non-Christian and the life of a Christian. We should not live according to the will of the gender, but we need to live according to the will of God because our life on earth is very short. And also in verses 4 to 6 we see 4 to 6 Before that, let me just say one more thing about verses uh, 2 and 3. We take life for granted, in fact, until we have to suffer. Then our values change. Life is short. We may suffer. Our values will change as we suffer. We suffer for the right things, not for the wrong things. Keeping that mind in mind, the brevity of life, we need to endure the trials in our life. There's going to be judgment. That's what we see in verses uh, 4 to 6. The judgment is going to come soon. Verse 4, wherein they think, it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Who is the one who is going to judge both quick and the dead? The one who is living and one who is dead. It's God, isn't it? So we need to, we need to keep in mind that there's going to be a judgment. If people are going to make us suffer more, God is going to judge them. We see that from the history of Israel. And for the sufferings that we go through 
and still keep doing the will of God will be rewarded. It's God alone who can judge both the living and the dead. Verse 6 is a challenge. Like chapter 3 verse 19 is a challenge. I know I'm going to raise a lot of uh, questions in your mind as I interpret this verse. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Okay? And they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Now, now that last clause is going to help us to understand. But live according to God in the spirit. So the way I understand this verse is like this. People who had heard the gospel, made a decision to believe in Christ, but now dead. They died in the flesh, but they're going to live. Because they have believed in God. So there's going to be a judgment. We need to keep that in mind. So don't get uh, really upset with people who speak evil about you who persecute you, who trouble you, but God is going to judge. Many people have heard the gospel, suffered for the gospel and died and they'll come back to life because they heard the gospel and believed and now they're dead, but they'll come back to life. So consistently, we are holding to the view that there is no second chance for those who are dead without Christ. Is that clear to you? Verses 7 to 11 we see that the suffering that comes to the church unifies the church. That brings in unity. He says here that be sober. Look at verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober. Watch unto prayer. Be sober. What does it mean? Be serious minded. Be serious about living for God. You know, don't take it lightly. You have come here to prepare for the ministry, isn't it? Every Christian is called to serve. Not just those who come to Bible college. But every Christian is called of God to serve. Every Christian has a spiritual gift to minister in the body of Christ. In the light of suffering, we need to have that seriousness of mind. Because Christ is coming. You unite yourself by being sober. Prayer brings us all together, isn't it? When we pray, we all come together with one mind. He's already said, have the same mind which Christ has. We need to have that mind of Christ in order to come together, to pray together. The church all over should come together to pray in the light of the persecution that's going on. Recently somebody shared the video, maybe in the Northeast, I think that is, maybe Assam. Looks like it's Islam to me. People are worshipping. They have put the green, you know, cloth around. Some plastic uh, roof with bamboo. Looks like Northeast to me. Tripura, see? As people are worshipping, they're tearing down the church which is like a tabernacle to What a faith those people must have had, isn't it? They're not retaliating. But they're just continuing to do the will of God, praising and worshipping God, in spite of all the troubles that they're facing. I don't know how soon we'll become the victim of the sufferings like that. Pray, pray for the people who are suffering. In your prayer every day, in your personal prayer, include 
praying for the people who are suffering for Christ. Don't take it lightly. We take it very lightly when it comes to other suffering. We take our problems very seriously. That's what uh, Mr. Jai Shankar, our external affairs minister, he says, Europe thinks their problem is global problem, but our problem is local problem. The same principle here, okay? When our, we face problem, it is global. Others' problem is local. No. If the church is touched anywhere, we all need to come together, unite our hearts, and pray for the safety of these Christians and a better witness for the Lord. And above all things, have fervent charity. You know, have that fervent love for the people. Love them. Love people. Even, what, what did Jesus say? Hate your enemies or love your enemies? Love your enemies. It's so hard. Jesus did not give us easy principles to follow. Huh? Jesus gave us some hard principles to follow. Loving your friend, family is easy, but loving your enemy is very hard. Enemy is anyone who is trying to hurt you. If you have that love, it will cover multitudes of sin. If you love, but don't take advantage of love. You do whatever you want and say, you must forgive me because God says that we must love and it covers. No, that's not it. We need to show hospitality to the people. In those days, there were no hotels, right? They stayed in Christian houses. When they were chased, they had to hide in some Christian houses, they had to show hospitality. Jesus himself experienced good hospitality and some bad experiences, people, isn't it? When he went into that Pharisee's house, he was not given even water to wash his hands and feet. But the woman applied perfume and wiped with her hair. Hospitality was not shown to Jesus. So you and I will not be shown the same kind of hospitality that one should show. But we should be the ones to show hospitality. I remember my parents, particularly my mother, right? Anyone who came, even in the middle of the night, in the name of Christ, she just fed them. They would go to pastor. And the pastor tells, go to Duwakar's house. I don't know. I've seen strange people living in our house for months in the name of Christ. So many relatives would come to our house. Live for two months. Feeding them is not easy. All right. And 20, 20 people, 20, 25 people in the, in the house. How we slept, how we was the restroom, I don't know. But we put up with all those inconveniences. We never grumbled either. Alright? We never, never grumbled. Hospitality must be shown without grudging. Don't hold any grudge. And verse 10 says, every man hath received the gift. Every man. Every Christian has received a spiritual gift. If you claim to be a Christian, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, as your personal savior, you have a spiritual gift. You need to identify what gift God has given you. I never thought I would be a preacher or, or a teacher. I didn't have that ability at all. After I accepted Jesus Christ, I slowly discovered that I had the ability to teach and preach. My teachers identified it. My fellow students identified it. 
And God gave me an opportunity to exercise that spiritual gift. I was invited in so many places to preach. And the maximum satisfaction I get is when I teach. May there be one student or ten students, it doesn't matter. Teaching brings satisfaction to me. Don't think that if you have a spiritual gift, you should be preaching to 5,000, 10,000 people like Jesus did. It doesn't matter how big is your church or how big is your college, how big is your country, it doesn't matter. But God has given you the gift and use it faithfully for God's glory. It's only the light of the suffering here that people were going through that some had the gift of showing hospitality. Remember, they could minister one to another within the body of Christ with a gift that was given to them. We need to be good stewards in using the spiritual gift. If I show laziness in teaching, ah, that's not good stewardship. Huh? Sometimes I feel I had more time to prepare notes. Huh? I had more time to read. You will not realize it now. As you make progress in your ministry, you are going to realize time is not adequate. You need more time. And I have asked God, give me another five years to do more than what I have done in 35 years or plus. It says here, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom be praise and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. If you have to prophesy, today we don't prophesy, all right? There's no prophetic gift. Prophetic gift and apostleship. All these are foundational upon which the church is built. There is no need for us to lay the foundation again. So what are the gifts that we have? We need to use it for the glory of God. According to the ability that God has given you, don't compare yourself with others. Is that clear? Your gift may be different. Other people's gift may be different. <clears throat> gift may be same. You may be more faithful than the other person. But at, you may have a small ministry. But you be faithful. Be faithful. Do it for the glory of God. You know, the spiritual gifts talks about the unity in the church. Is that clear? Minister one to another. Pray for one another. Show hospitality. Show love. When they're in the light of suffering, care for one another. Lastly, we see that suffering brings glory to God. Suffering brings glory to God. Verse 12 says, Beloved, think it is it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Every Christian is going to face some kind of trial. That kind of trial we are facing today in the ministry, we never thought we'll be facing these kind of trials. Huh? We never expected. But there are trials that we are going through. There are times we are impatient. There are times we talk to ourselves and pray, Lord, help us to go through this. And it says that you need to rejoice in trials. How many of you rejoice in trials? I have a hard time rejoicing in trials. Do you? When difficulties come, hey, praise the Lord, you want to say? 
Paul says that rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. My mind drifts into Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas are put in the prison. What are they doing? Sitting and whining? Complaining? Or praising God? They're praising God. For Christ's sake, when you suffer, you can rejoice. When you suffer for your own faults, it is not easy to rejoice. Is that clear? We need to be partakers of Christ's sufferings. If you are reproached for the sake of Christ's name, be happy. You know, don't, don't, don't be sad. Don't be sad. Don't be ashamed in trials. If you, if you suffer for Christ's sake, be happy. But you can't be happy as if you suffer as a murderer or a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. You know, if you are suffering for these sakes, then it's a shameful thing. If you are suffering for Christ's name, it's okay. It's, it's okay. You can rejoice. Today we see so many people suffering for the greed that they have, the lust that they have. A pastor was uh, arrested. I, 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 I know this man. All right, he's from my native place. Because of some abuse in the church. This is of another women in the church. It's bad. It's shameful. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on his behalf. You see? If you're suffering for Christ, just rejoice. Don't have to be ashamed. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because it's the power of God unto salvation. It's, it demonstrates the power. It releases the power to transform a person. I know what I was before I accepted Christ. There was a transformation in my life after I accepted Christ. Yes, we can witness trials in our life. If, if God is sending trials to the church now, this is evidence that he will someday judge the lost. Remember that. Don't think that anyone will go without being punished. To the extent God allows the church to suffer, to that extent, the church will suffer. Sometimes people may overdo it. Is that clear? People who don't know, do not believe in Christ may overdo it. Like Edom did to Israel. God will punish such people more than others. We have our trials now. But we'll participate in the glory later. Lost people have their glory now. But they're going to suffer later. Witness trials. Witness in trials. If the righteous case will be said, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Where will they go? If righteous are going to be scarcely saved, from those trials. Where will the unsaved go? Where will the non-Christians go? To persecute Christians. So in the light of all this, in verse 19, Paul says, you know, you commit yourself to God. I think that's a good conclusion that he draws here. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto faithful creator. God is our creator. God is our sustainer. He's going to keep us. Commit your life to God. 
You and I need to commit our lives unto God. When we suffer, we need to ask this question. Am I suffering for Christ's sake or am I suffering for my own faults? We need to ask those questions. Is that clear? And we should make sure that we are suffering only for the sake of Christ, not for our mistakes, our sinful acts. Commit your life to God today. When you commit your life to God, your life is safe. Your life is safe. Entrust yourself unto God, unto God's care. May God bless you as you ponder over 1 Peter chapter 4. There are benefits for suffering. It brings glory to God. It purifies us. And it unites the church. And it's all for God's glory. May God bless you.